Since the United States Navy retired the last of the Iowa-class battleships in 1992, which should be for the very last time, the Navy has been trying to come up with a way to provide effective naval fire support, and so far has failed to do so. To be honest, I was surprised at how poorly some of these naval programs have gone and what the current state of naval surface fire support actually is. So I went out to find out why this is the case. In this episode, we'll take a look at the current requirements of effective naval fire support, as well as what the current capabilities of the United States Navy is in this area. I've been able to find some articles by naval experts, some congressional reports, and some other things that will help us understand this important topic, and I'm looking forward to share that information with you. Before we get into the topic, though, I do want to ask you guys, if you can help support me through Patreon, please do so. The Learning Military channel is something that I'm doing as part of academic research for school. So your guys' financial contribution really goes to help out with this research. There are some sources that I'm not able to get to because they cost money. And your financial contributions will also do things like help support my tuition costs as well as books and things like that. So anything that you guys can do to help out there is greatly appreciated. You'll find the link to Patreon in the description below. Now, since this is a YouTube channel, I also want to ask you guys to comment, like, subscribe, all of that. Subscribing and hit the bell icon is really helpful because in the next episode, we're going to continue on with this topic and look at some of the proposed solutions to the issue of naval surface fire support. So you're going to want to make sure you come back for it. And that notification will help you know when this video is released. All right, back to the topic at hand, naval surface fire support. Let's start off by taking a look at why naval surface fire support in the current state is even an issue. First off, it is very possible that in a conflict with Iran or China and potentially others, an amphibious landing is going to be needed at some point. And to continue to be honest with things here, an amphibious landing made against a semi-competent adversary in the 21st century is going to be very costly. The force concentration required to pull off a successful landing and technological advances necessitates the United States to be able to bring all our forces to bear on the enemy during that very critical point. Now, naval surface fire support is one tool that is called for during an amphibious assault. And as a side note, I was also surprised to learn that naval fire support is also called for as an option in U.S. Army airborne operations. But that's a cool little thing that I learned. Without being able to provide effective fire support from sea, we are talking about the United States sustaining higher casualties and also increased difficulty in completing the outline objectives of that amphibious landing. Forces on shore are going to need to be able to call in fire missions to destroy things like heavy emplacements, to neutralize enemy positions, destroy enemy artillery, or any other vital targets. So what are the requirements that have been laid out to be able to say that we are providing effective fire support? Well, the United States Marine Corps has set a requirement for the Navy to provide fire support anywhere within the range of 41 to 63 nautical miles. Now, they have expressed, though, that in the future, they would like to be able to expand that range to 200 nautical miles. In addition to a range requirement, there's also a time requirement. And that time requirement originally stated that there needed to be at most two and a half minutes between the time that a call for fire support came in and weapon impact. But over time, that has uh, been lifted to where it is now two and a half minutes is what should be expected between when a call for fire support comes in and weapons release. Now that is a pretty significant difference. So what is that big problem? I mean, we've got some things that can probably meet those requirements, right? Well, let's take a look at what can meet those requirements. There's just one, a Tomahawk cruise missile. Now each Tomahawk cruise missile costs about $1.9 million and a Tomahawk missile takes up a VLS cell on a ship. If you're not familiar with VLS, it stands for Vertical Launching System, and this is the system that you see on the news whenever we're launching missiles off of some of our naval vessels. Each VLS cell, which is basically an individual missile canister inside of the VLS system, uh, can be filled with a wide variety of different weapons. Because our surface combatants, our cruisers and destroyers, have to fill a wide variety of roles within the fleet, these VLS cells could be filled with an anti-air missile, missiles for ballistic missile defense, anti-submarine action, and so on. So when you read an Arleigh Burke class destroyer has 90 VLS cells available on board, keep in mind that some of these will be filled with Tomahawk missiles, but will likely have to contain a wide variety of different weapons. So the amount of Tomahawk missiles that a vessel can carry is pretty limited. Now when all the Tomahawk missiles are used up, or really any missile in the VLS system, 
they can't be reloaded at sea. This requires the ship to basically go back to port to be reloaded, taking the ship out of the area of operations. So you can see some of the issues of relying on Tomahawk missiles. They're expensive at $1.9 million a shot. They do travel comparatively slow to say a projectile fired out of a five inch gun. The max speed of a Tomahawk missile is 0.75. They are limited in numbers to what can be carried in a VLS system because of the different variety of weapons that a ship has to carry with them. And they also cannot be reloaded at sea. To be honest, a Tomahawk missile, and this should have been very clear and pretty obvious to a lot of you, that a Tomahawk missile isn't really there to be able to provide fire support. It is a tactical strike weapon. However, they do offer the range needed in the USMC requirements and actually exceed it since their maximum range is about 1,000 miles. They are designed to travel in a way too that hostile targets can't hide behind terrain as easily as say a projectile fired out of a five inch gun as they can come in from different angles of attack. The Tomahawk missiles can pack a significant punch and can be directed or redirected in flight to hit a different target after it's been launched. Heck, there's a new version of the Tomahawk missile that is being developed that can even hit a moving target. So there are some benefits of using Tomahawk missiles, but again, these are supposed to be used for a tactical strike weapon. All right, so what about the gun on board the ship? We've referenced the five inch gun a couple of times. This is where naval surface fire support has come from in the past. It's been these large guns that have done the dirty work. It can't be understated how important the gun is even today to naval surface fire support. For example, during Operation Desert Storm, the Iowa class battleships and the fire support that they had the potential to provide did a lot to make the threat of an amphibious assault into Kuwait more credible. So just the guns alone and what they were capable of doing forced Saddam Hussein to dedicate more troops to an amphibious assault that never came to be. Therefore, he diverted a lot of his troops away from the real invasion. So again, just the fear alone of naval surface fire support was significant. But now the capabilities of the current weapon present the biggest challenge of all when it comes to providing naval fire support. The five inch gun on board our ships now have a range of 13 nautical miles, which is 20 to 32% of the range that the United States Marine Corps requires for fire support right now. At 13 nautical miles, a ship is likely within range of some enemy artillery, especially the artillery that uses rocket assisted projectiles. And it is likely within range of enemy artillery before the ship itself is within range to fire on a target. That alone is a major issue, but range is not the only issue out there with the five inch guns. Now I found a number of articles on the navalist.com which was written by Commander Keith Patton and he was able to do some great research in this area and was able to provide some information about some of the additional issues with the 5 inch gun and naval support. Particularly with the amount of ammunition that a destroyer or cruiser would be able to bring with them and how it would be employed. Commander Patton found that a destroyer would likely carry 244 rounds and a cruiser would likely carry 389 rounds for the 5 inch gun. He went on to estimate that an average fire mission would require a ship to expend about 22 rounds each time a mission was called for. That means a destroyer could fully support 11 fire missions with the maximum ammunition and a cruiser could fully support 17 fire missions before all ammunition on board the vessel is expended. To go further, Commander Patton also pointed out that during an assault, a request for fire support would likely come in during the assault phase once every four and a half minutes and would likely decrease to one fire mission every 20 minutes as things calm down. That means that a destroyer would run out of ammunition anywhere within one to four hours and a cruiser would run out of ammunition completely within one to six hours. Now, even though this is a short amount of time, this type of rate of fire isn't even possible though. According to the Navy, and this was also found by Commander Patton, that if 40 rounds are fired within a four hour time frame, the five inch gun on board a vessel can become too hot and endanger the entire ship. So in reality, a ship can really respond to a call for fire once every two hours without of course exposing the ship to danger. During the assault phase when combat is most intense, this lack of fire support is really problematic and could lead to disaster. 
Remember, we're talking about a call for fire support potentially coming in every four and a half minutes when things are most intense. But some of our vessels can only do one fire support mission every two hours. This is a pretty big gap between what is needed to sustain the necessary fire support for an amphibious assault and what our capabilities really are. In the next episode, we're going to talk about some of the solutions that have been proposed by the U.S. Navy and Commander Patton on how we're going to fill this gap. For example, some people have talked about bringing back battleships. Is that really going to be the way to go? We'll also look at some of the naval programs that have been put in place and how successful they really are and discuss why what might be on the horizon. So I hope you guys come back for that. Again, subscribe if you haven't already. Share this if you think that there is somebody who might find something interesting out of this. And again, if you can support me on Patreon and the Learning Military channel, that would be awesome. So thanks for watching, and I've got your six.